Hello from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and my topic this time around is essentially the most famous work by the French comedic playwright who called himself Moliere. This, of course, is The Misanthrope. However, before I can reasonably begin addressing that topic, I need to deal with a bit of a backstory involving the French culture within which Jean-Baptiste Pocquillon, Moliere, was born into a successful bourgeois Parisian family in 1622. Described by Niccolo Machiavelli in The Prince as the best ordered and governed kingdom in Europe, in France, as pointed out by H.G. Wells in the Outline of History, there had been no Magna Carta, and there was no tradition of parliamentary rule limiting royal power. Consequently, with the aid of an able administrator called Cardinal Riquelieu, King Louis XIII, as described in Alexander Dumas' The Three Musketeers, established a royal monopoly of force, sided with the Catholic Church during conflicts arising from the Protestant Reformation, and ultimately became an absolute monarch, beginning extensive expansion of the Louvre Palace in Paris and overseeing a royal aristocracy that dominated the country and continued to do so under his successor, Louis XIV, the Sun King, who had the Palace of Versailles constructed outside the crowded capital and reigned until 39 years after Moliere's death in 1673. Now, whether or not Louis XIV ever really said, la estate est et moi, the state it is me, high Renaissance ideals regarding absolutism were not the only conceptual imports making their way along the Riviera from the Italian city-state of Florence into France. Also arriving with the rebirth of classical culture were such aesthetic ideals as proportion, order, clarity, and adherence within dramatic literature to the Aristotelian unities of time, place, and action, as well as a taste for tragedy that influenced the theatrical works of Jean Racine and Pierre Cornet. At the same time, however, Another Italian tradition also had come to France, the more colloquial Commedia dell'arte, which was chiefly improvised based on scenarios generally dealing with jealousy, sex, and old age using a stock set of characters. It was this type of theater company which Jean-Baptiste joined at the age of 21 after having received a Jesuit education in philosophy, rhetoric, and law, ten years following the death of his mother when taking possession of his maternal inheritance. Just a year later, he assumed the theater's leadership and began to use the name Moliere, as well as, apparently, becoming the lover of a member of the acting company, Madeleine Bijat. Failing to achieve much success in Paris, as suggested by the fact of his having been imprisoned for debt on a pair of occasions, he eventually took the company off into the provinces for a dozen or so years, developing its reputation and beginning to write plays such as The Physician in Spite of Himself, The Learned Ladies, and The Miser. In 1658, the traveling theater company was invited by the brother of Louis XIII to return to Paris and appear before the king in the Palace of the Louvre. From that point on, Moliere continued to perform for the royal court, ultimately completing 30 plays and, after having married a supposed sister of his former lover, an actress who was 20 years younger than himself and rumored to have been his own daughter, although that's more likely that she had been Madeline's illegitimate child by the Duke of Mondian. Nonetheless, 
Moliere, as explained by Donald Frame within the Signet Classics publication of his plays, continued to maintain a relationship with Madeline, providing her with three grandchildren, the first of whom had King Louis XIV himself as a grand godfather until her death in 1672. A year later, the actor playwright himself collapsed on stage during a performance and died before he could be taken to receive medical assistance. Now, notwithstanding some of the more or less salacious biographical details which Moliere himself addressed in his somewhat autobiographical play, The School for Wives, as W.G. Moore points out in Moliere and New Criticism, it is because of the plays and not the personal life that French itself has come to be termed the language of Moliere. Where the theatrical works and the lived experience of their writer, as well as his interpretation of social, cultural, and philosophical issues come together is pretty much anybody's guess. Nonetheless, at least one consistent theme within Moliere's body of work seems to be the issue of hypocrisy. Of course, calling attention to that subject tends to provoke hypocrites of all kinds, and especially those who, for their own advantage, hide behind religion. This is exactly what the free-wielding playwright encountered following the initial production of his script entitled Tartuffe. Having breached what the Reformation and French Huguenot in battle Janicists within the Catholic Church considered to be the bonds of propriety, the play was quickly banned in May of 1664, and for the next half decade, Moliere engaged in legal efforts to have it once again performed extensively revising the script and renaming it The Imposture, only to have the show banned again, even after Moliere's company had been officially appointed the King's Troop in 1665. Considering the introduction of Tortouf, as well as petitions to rid society of the impious actor-author, when writing his great farce The Misanthrope, it appears that Moliere may have provided a deliberate, calculated reply to the criticism which he had been experiencing, especially with regard to his tendency towards naturalism in place of the artificiality of style which was common among his theatrical contemporaries. This specific issue is directly addressed in the first act of The Misanthrope, when the central character, Alcès, is compelled to offer commentary about a poem written by a romantic rival for the attention of a young widow named Selimi. The consequence in the play, as with Tortouf, is a contentious lawsuit. Alcès's vehement is directed towards the manners of the age, asserting in the Pulitzer Prize winning and former poet laureate to the United States Library of Congress Richard Wilbur's verse translation of the misanthrope, this artificial style that's all the fashion has neither taste nor honesty nor passion. In this manner, Moliere presents his stylistic beliefs in a distinctly drawn comic portrait that is intended, I think, to be both entertaining and to get his point across that artificiality in art, like religious hypocrisy, is a negative influence upon society. Further demonstrating the humor which can be derived from calling out pretensions, Salome offers verbal caricatures of eight members of the royal court who each exhibit the peculiar affectations that the script seeks to ridicule. Within the play, according to um, Gilbert Height in the classical tradition, the characteristics of a lover are almost directly 
derived from the Roman poet Lucretius. Lovers, Salamine states, rarely love to criticize. Instead, again from the Wilbur translation, they see their lady as a charming blur and find all things commendable in her. If she has any blemish, fault, or shame, they will redeem it by a pleasing name. It is precisely this tendency to misrepresent or improve upon the things which reality presents to the senses that Moliere appears to have seen as a fundamental cause for duplicity and artificiality in art, as well as hypocrisy within society. When Alsace tries to confront his beloved with regard to the superficiality of such conventions, thanks to the demands placed upon him resulting from the lawsuit, he is called away, stating in his frustration, again is conveyed in the Richard Wilbur translation, it seems that fate, no matter what I do, has sworn that I may not converse with you. But, madam, pray permit your faithful lover to try once more before the day is over. Alset's exit closes Act 4. It's only after the entire set of the play's characters have been assembled and then dispersed in Act 5 with what Hallam Walker has observed in his book on Moliere is a careful repetition of the preceding acts that the full and uninterrupted statement of aesthetic principles is finally presented. Alcès's last speech of any length in Act 5, Scene 7 is the culmination of the patterns which Moliere establishes and maintains throughout the play. Literally, it is an overture to the artistic muse in hope, like Shakespeare's Prospero in The Tempest, of possessing the pure spirit of poetry within a remotely isolated place. During all of this scene, neither Salome nor Alcès are referred to by name, suggesting, to me at least, that Moliere is speaking here for and as himself, stating, Ah, traitress, how should I cease to love you even now, though mind and will were passionately bent on hating you, my heart would not consent. The dramatic import here is sufficiently weak, suggesting the existence of some underlying intentions which, I think, make the speech pregnant with meaning. Salome has ridiculed Alcesse in her letters as well as the others, and there is very little to present the expression of his justified wrath as it does finally emerge before the end of the play. This is postponed, however, in order to allow Moliere an opportunity to fix blame and state that, even after the criticism of Tartuffe, after he had been wronged by art and engaged in a losing lawsuit to have the play's restriction ended, he cannot give up on the theater as his mistress of choice. As with all stage presentations, the lines directed towards characters within the play are also addressed to the audience. In this instance, specifically stating be witness to my madness, each of you. See what infatuation drives one to. But wait, my folly's only just begun, and I shall prove to you before I'm done how strange the human heart is, and how far from rational we sorry creatures are. The appeal is to Moliere's audience to witness both his further devotion to his muse and the play itself as evidence of that devotion. He then asserts that he must lay the blame on these corrupting times. It's the idealized literary style of neoclassicism, Moliere asserts, which needs to be redeemed, 
claiming, it is nothing but a sort of wordy play, and nature never spoke that way to his 17th century audience in Paris and at the Palace of Versailles. However, the idea of someone choosing to fly to some wild, trackless, solitary place in which to forget the human race would make Alcesse a comic character indeed even while Moliere is trying to bring his work into the realm of realism. Then, because the manners of the age wouldn't allow for anything like William Wordsworth's spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions for about another 130 years, Moliere has the character of Alceste embedded in his comic misanthropy leave the stage. Although the appeal is rejected, Although he is unable to bring his muse away from the euphemistic world of neoclassical French society, and it would finally take a full-scale rebellion in 1789 and a trip to the guillotine for Louis XVI, his wife Marie Antoinette, and almost any of the aristocracy who could be rounded up to succeed in bringing that change about, Moliere's call for an artistic revolution had been made. The misanthrope ends in victory for neoclassical convention, but the stage is left empty, and order has not been reestablished. The play ends in disunity rather than adhering to the Aristotelian notion that comedies conclude with union, usually marriage, and tragedies end in disunion and significant loss, most often death. As a result, it is this indictment of artificiality towards which the entire play seems to be directed. Moliere clearly defines the stylistic limitations of neoclassicism during the misanthrope and then states his opposition to them and calls attention to a need for change. Repeatedly, the play demonstrates that ornate style is contrived and unnatural. Affectation is ridiculed in each of the comedy scenes in one form or another. And the overall effect is a general condemnation of the willful illusion to which he appears to have felt that neoclassicism was prone. Moliere's intention I feel it can be concluded, was to assert that rigid doctrines of traditional artistic and possibly personal norms were insufficient and that there should be room for various types of innovation. In making this declaration, I think that Moltaire, Moliere was consciously reenacting to the highly restrictive attitudes of his time, as well as making a very early stylistic contribution to the kind of evolution that would eventually lead to Romanticism. He seems to have seen, as Hallam Walker states in his study of Moliere, that serious theater was in danger of being overwhelmed by illusory spectacle, and so, in place of orthodox literary standards, he proposed to incarnate real life. Prefiguring John Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn, Moliere perceived the equation between truth and beauty, and his insight caused him to continually strive for more and more realism within his plays. He sought, as Roman Fernandez states in uh, Moliere, as seen through the plays, to pick up life by its commonplace, everyday handle. As a result, Moliere approached a type of romantic representation, which in Wordsworthian terms, rejoices in the presence of truth. I'm Jeff Helgeson. An Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois, 
and is open six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday, from noon till seven o'clock in the evening. Next time, I'll be talking about a novel by another pseudonymous nun de plume using Frenchman, Voltaire's Candide.